Hi everyone, I'm Bill Vassilakis, the Senior Minister of Christian Family Centre Churches and the lead pastor of our mother church at Seaton. We're located at 185 Frederick Road, between Trimmer Parade and Grange Road by the railway line, and we've been operating in the western suburbs of Adelaide for 44 years. And uh, our desire is to add value to our community and to be a blessing to all people. We love Jesus Christ, we love people, and uh, we are on Channel 44 because we want to be a help to you in your spiritual journey, particularly if it's your first time uh, tuning in. Uh, it's my prayer that uh, God will really speak to you through this service, the singing, the prayers, uh, the ministry of the Word, and also a time where you can respond to Jesus Christ personally and receive grace and mercy and help in your time of need. Enjoy the service. This morning I'm sharing on daring to plant in faith. Um, our Daring Faith series, I trust you're enjoying it. I trust you're enjoying Rick Warren in uh, the small groups, your life groups, and listening to this uh, genius of a man who's able to, to share God's word so powerfully. He has been a blessing to me over the decades since uh, I've been aware of his ministry, been at the church there several times. Uh, the Bible compares the Christian life to gardening, to farming, over and over again. And I know some things about gardening because I was brought up on a market garden in the western suburbs. My dad had four or five acres of, of land and this is way before it was all developed. So it was all market gardens. The Greeks, the Italians, the Bulgarians, they owned the whole of the western districts and they fed the whole of Australia, I reckon. So. Um, um, so gardening is um, something that I'm, I'm aware of, though I, I actually don't like gardening. I don't know what happened there. I think Dad had me working in the market garden since I was about eight years of age. Dad, can I have threepence to get some fruit tinkles in the garden, do about an hour's work, and I get my threepence to go. So uh, I used to, did not enjoy it, but I'm so thankful that he never gave me money unless I worked for it and uh, sweated and able to do my chores. So we had to do work as little kids in the garden, but uh, maybe it's built an ethic of, of working hard in, in, in my life since then. But uh, um, so sharing today on, on this, it's, it's specifically I want to, to lay a strong principle regarding God's laws of the harvest, God's laws of planting and harvesting. Uh, it's the law of sowing and reaping. Genesis 8.22 says, as long as the earth endures, there will be seed time and harvest. And Paul says in Galatians 6, spiritualizing this, he goes, don't be misled, no one makes a fool of God. Whatever a person plants, he will also harvest. So he's looking at, at not just the physical aspects of sowing and reaping, but the relational, the spiritual, the emotional. It says that uh, he will harvest, not he might harvest, it'll happen folks. Whatever a person plants, he will harvest. If you ignore the laws of sowing and reaping in your life, the positive laws of sowing and reaping, it's gonna hurt you and uh, it'll harm you and I don't want you harmed. God doesn't want you harmed. That's why in his word, he's so clear on this. If you wisely use the laws of sowing and reaping in your life, you're going to be blessed by them. And I stand here today as a blessed man that I've been operating these laws my whole life. In fact, I'm thankful to my parents uh, as beautiful Greek family who built this into their lives and into, into my life um, from, from a young kid, their generosity 
uh, was fantastic. I used to resent it sometimes that mum would just cook these great big pots of beautiful, what we say, fasolada, you know, or, or um, you know, pea soups. And, and anyone and everyone would come because they knew Maria Vasilakis has got good food. So they'd be popping in there. And, and, and one time I said to mum, why can't we just have a meal on our own without other people around us? Oh, she said, Billy, she goes, we've got to do it because we've got to be hospitable. So she's always sowing. In the midst of when dad would lose his whole crop because of frost, he would steal every year. He'd even actually go to the bank and borrow some money to send food, not food materials, but clothing materials and utensils back to his island near the coast of Turkey, the island of Vicaria. He had great big bundles. Even when we didn't have anything, he'd say, we've got to give, we've got to support them. I remember once there was a little girl in Icaria who had a hole in her heart and there wasn't a specialist surgeon in Athens that could actually do the operation. So Dan and a group of other Icarians, men and families raised, I think it must have been something like 10,000 pounds or something like, some huge amount in the 60s uh, before decimal currency to not just fly her there but to pay for the medical services and for the f- several months that she'd have to be in hospital. And I just, those things were, were riveted into my mind that life is not just about us, it's, it's actually, and I look at my dad, how he prospered and was blessed and uh, yet he never asked for it. And I think he just gave and gave and gave and sowed and sowed. And I think when I became a Christian, born again, I realized he was actually operating a, the law of, of, of reciprocal return, the law of sowing and reaping. And it works, it works. And uh, I've yet to find an example where it doesn't work. It works in the positive, it works in the negative. You can use these laws literally in every single area of your life. You can use the laws of sowing and reaping in your relationships, in relation to your health, to your finances, to your career. Uh, Whatever you need more of in your life, you need to plant the appropriate seeds of faith. Hear me on this, whatever you need more of in your life, you've got to plant the appropriate seeds of faith. It's actually involved in the giving end of life, being like God. If you, if you like, <laughs> if some of you think, look, I, I, I just, you know, I feel like I need a bit more appreciation. You know, I need people to notice me a little bit more and to say thank you to me and appreciate me. And uh, you might be waiting a long time for that to happen. But if you decide to start a campaign of seed sowing and call that seed appreciation, to see somebody and appreciate them, add value to their lives and start sowing into them, you know what's gonna find? You're gonna have that come back to you where you will be appreciated by so many people. If you need more talent, you need to start using the little talent that you've got. You might say, I don't have much, but you've got something. You must say, oh, I haven't got much compared to these people. Well, if you don't use it, you're gonna lose it. But if you start see it as seed and you start in using it, amazingly, that talent will grow. God will pop in another talent. If you need more time, if you need more money, if you need more energy, start sowing your time and money and energy into Jesus' causes. And I tell you, it'll come back to you. If you're saying, I need more energy. Hey, listen, go to the gym. Sow yourself there and you, you will actually get stronger and sow more, more energy. If you, you know, if I do my exercises each morning and uh, you know, my physiotherapist a few years ago gave me some exercises to deal with my, my neck and uh, which causes me a few problems. And I can pray about it and I can, and, and, but really actually God's given us doctors and physiotherapists says, well actually this is what you need to do because you sit down too long and you bend your head and so when you get up in the morning, oh, these are a bunch of exercises, I just do them every day. So I'm sowing the right stuff and I'm experiencing wonderful liberty. If I don't do it, I've got a frozen shoulder, a frozen neck. So when it comes to your health, you sow the right stuff. You know, sometimes we just need to sow the right stuff. You don't say, oh, you know, you don't even need to pray about it actually. Just <laughs> there's some divine laws, there's some practical laws, just build it in, 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 into, your, into your life. So um, start sowing your time, money and energy into the causes that really add value to people's lives. If you need more witnessing power, right, we've got names of people there and I'm so thankful that you've put people's names down there and there may be somebody on your heart 
that you'd say, look, I'd like the whole church every Sunday to pray for them as well. Don't give personal details, just even maybe give a name or initials, and my wife and I have done that, and, uh, and we're, we're just using this as a point of contact every week, and we pray that God will open the hearts of people. But more than that, as we do that, you know, we're sowing concern and interest and heart, and we pray, God, Give me the opportunity, create the opportunities by which I can share my faith. So uh, if you need more witnessing power, you need to pray with the expectation the Holy Spirit will give you the opportunities to step out in faith and to share your personal story. I know when I came to Christ as a young bloke, I was only 17, and and I had a few insecurities and... um, um, and so I came to faith, but the person who led me to Jesus, and then the first person I witnessed to was one of my best friends, and uh, he, he was in a little bit of trouble, and, and he came to faith, and so these two were giants. So we would go out witnessing, and I'd let them do it, and I'd sit behind, and I'd go, gee, they're fantastic, gee, they're good, I couldn't do what they do. And, and what made you sick about them is they were so handsome, one of them looked like Elvis Presley, the other one looked like John Bon Jovi. They're really good looking guys and they're very charismatic and so people just naturally, me, I'm as skinny as a rake, like I had to run around the shower to get wet every morning and uh, you know, like bones were sticking out here and my nose was accentuated and, and don't look at me now, I've put it in the wrong places. But you know, it's like as a kid growing up, you develop some inferiorities about how you look and how people perceive you. So I just love these two guys and I just thought, I just sat, I listened to them witnessing and they were fantastic. And then they both fell away from the things of God. Broke my heart. Like they just, for varying reasons, you know, I, I loved them then, I still love them now, I still pray for them that they'll come back. But I was left alone. I was left alone, it was just me and Jesus. <laughs> and I thought, well, what am I gonna do now? My heroes had fallen away. I had to step out. I thought I had just a little talent. So I started using it to witness. And amazingly, within six, seven months, as that grew, by the following year, 1972, when I I went back and finished uh, my year 12, I failed the year before, uh, God was able to, to use that little talent that had developed to see a revival take place in that school. We sang about revival. Doesn't actually fall out of heaven. It comes by people responding to Jesus and growing and stepping out in faith and and using the talent they have and daring to speak and share. And we had a tremendous mood, but I think it was just that little insecurity, those those fears, those worries and looking at others, you know, idolising these two guys who were fantastic. And I realised I've I've got to use what I've got, otherwise I'm going to lose it. And it was amazing what, what God did in and through my life. We have a wonderful lady named Annie. Where are you, Annie? Come, come to the front, Annie. Pastor Janet Bryce, come and interview this magnificent lady and uh, share. When Janet mentioned the story to me of what's happened with Annie, I thought, this is good. I've got to get her up to speak, even though she's a little bit scared, but, uh, but she's great. Yes, this is my friend Annie, and um, she is a wonderful spiritual gardener. She, in fact, she plants many seeds, and the Lord has really blessed her with some wonderful harvest as well. And the other day, she was just sharing with me about what happens when she goes to work. So, Annie, tell us, um, you know, your your uh, testimony of what you do when you go to work. Okay. First of all, good morning, everyone. Uh, um, that's it. I'll hold it. You just relax. <laughs> this is not really my forte, uh, speaking to people, especially this crowd. I can speak to one or two. That's it. That's me. This is more of my husband's work. He, he can do more of the talking than me. Well, anyway, my real name is Mary Ann, but I am known as Annie. Uh, I, I am a support, community support worker and I've been in this field for 10 years. I really love the work that I do and I deliver services to people with disabilities with different uh, backgrounds. 
I have attended shifts from half an hour shift to a longer period of time per day, dep depending on their needs. Uh, before attending the shift, of course, I have to read their care plans to better understand the things that I have to do for certain clients, plus the skills and the, and the training provided for by my company. But to highlight my testimony, um, sharing your faith and sharing a prayer to anyone is um, really not uh, part of my job. I can be in trouble sharing my faith because the clients might complain that I force them to uh, pray for them. But given the God's wisdom, I will always ask if it's okay to pray for them because as a person, I can do what I can do for them, but I have I've been helpless sometimes, and I have to uh, really uh, go to God also in prayer, and I will always ask them if they wanted to. And in, in different occasions, I pick two of uh, my experiences that really impacted my life. There was this uh, old man, uh, Englishman, 80-something uh, year, and when I attended a shift to him that day, he was really feeling down, and he said that his life is worthless. I strongly felt that he's thinking of committing a suicide that day. But when I approached him, sir, uh, is it okay for me to pray for you? And actually, that opportunity gave me to lead him to Jesus, to accept Jesus as his Savior and Lord of his life that day. And he was really blessed after I left and in tears, honestly, as, as, as far as I can remember. And there was another occasion uh, I prayed for this lady in, in 60 years age, of age, and she has a severe depression. She, don't, she doesn't know even how to motivate herself, even to eat, what to eat. But first of all, I asked her if you know, she needs prayer and that, and she was really very open to it, so I took the opportunity and prayed for this lady. Then she was really happy, and actually she even said, oh, I will request you for more shifts, she mm -hmm. said. So uh, praise the Lord for that. Yeah, I mean, that is good. Yeah, great. Very good. Oh, that's an encouragement. Wherever you are in your vocation, what you're doing, be available for business, eh? Hey? And in spite of one's fears and one's concerns, uh, always ask permission, though and particularly in your work situation. Always ask permission, and you'd be surprised how, how many people who are genuinely in need will say, yes, pray for me. Uh, so that's great, Annie. Um, whatever you need more of, you need to learn the laws of planting and harvesting, of sowing or reaping. You actually need to plant what you need. Seems, it's not double Dutch. Sorry to the Dutch people here. You actually need to plant what you need. So God's laws of, of planting and harvesting, let me give you a couple of them. Everything starts as a seed. This is the first law of the harvest. Every idea starts as a seed idea. Every dream starts as, as an idea, a dream. Every achievement. So you just think the power of a seed, the power of an idea, a good idea. That can be sown in someone's mind can be transformative and it can actually spread and grow. One little seed, you know? How many seeds are in an apple? Can you count them? Probably 10, 15? Grab one of those seeds and work out how many apples are in that seed. One seed. Not just, it becomes a tree, then that produces a thousand apples and they've got seeds. One seed can feed the world. The power of a seed, power of an idea. You have cement, oh, I can't believe you have cement that's laid down, then all of a sudden you see this green thing shooting up through the cement. Where'd you get the power from? There's power in a seed. There's life in a seed. It'll find a way to germinate. 
not just physically, but the power of an idea, a seeding, an action, can germinate and produce enormous good. It can also do a lot of evil. You know, the Christian Family Centre started as an idea back in 1976. And the first meeting, Mother's Day 1976, in, in, in someone's backyard shed that was lined uh, with a handful of teenagers. And I think the oldest person was 40. He was the old man. Your life started as a seed. When your father's seed was connected with your mother's egg, your life beca- began. You were a zygote. It's a terrible name, isn't it? A zygote. And it can't see you. You've got to get a microscope and you can see. Hey, a little cell. Oh, there's a nucleus. And there's DNA and there's chromosomes. That's you. Even the colour of your eyes. How tall you'll be. All your medical future is all stuck in there. It's like one seed. One seed. You started as a seed. Well, your dad's seed, your mum's seed, and you became a seed. Hey, don't need to explain that anymore, do I? (laughs) That's enough. Literally everything that's living on this planet came from a seed. If it didn't come from a seed, it's usually not alive. So God said in Genesis 1, 11, let the land have seed bearing plants and trees that bear fruit with seed in it according to their varieties. So a seed in our context here is anything valuable that you give away. A seed is anything valuable that you give away. Let's move away from the marketing illustration and and to to, to today, so to our lives. So when you give away your praise, and you honour somebody, it is such a valuable seed sowing operation. It's the same with your good advice. It's the same with your valuable time. The same with your hard earned money. Also your, your love and experience of life. To be able to sow into others to help them is living a life of epic proportions, of great nobility, that you're using the power of you're seeding something positive and good into the lives of other people. A God-blessed seed is anything that I give away in order to help somebody else. That's a God-blessed seed. So it all starts with the seed. Could be your time, your money, your appreciation, your wisdom, your energy, whatever. And, And by the way, your words are seeds. You're seed sowing today. When we finish this service and you go and have a cup of coffee, and, and you, you, you'll be seed sowing into some, someone's life. If you meet somebody that you don't know and you have a conversation, your words could be life altering, impacting to them. Words can be such life changing seeds when we plant them in, in, in someone's mind and they can grow and they can bear tremendous fruit. So you've got, to, you've got to choose your words wisely, especially when you're talking to people that you love. And uh, you know, practice with those you love because um, that's, that's a training ground for how to, to relate to people that are outside of your family. So when it comes to your children, to your grandkids, to your husband, your wife, your friends. Every time I take my grandkids out and I have different things, I'm, I'm trying to to add value to their lives and, and to just look them in the eye and, and to, 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 to praise them on something, to thank them. And, uh, you know, I'm a grandfather. I don't know how many years I've got left. I don't know how old the kids are going to be when I go be with Jesus. But while I'm here, I'm going to do everything I can to sow powerful seeds into their minds, into their hearts, like my parents did with me. I think every grandparent feels the same. So let me ask you this question. What kind of seeds are you planting in your relationships? Are you planting seeds of trust or seeds of of mistrust? Are you planting seeds of kindness or are you planting hurtful seeds, angry seeds, bitter seeds, mean-spirited seeds? Are you planting seeds that build people up or are you planting seeds that tear down? You will reap whatever you sow. Look at this verse in Ephesians 4.29. I've got my kids to memorise this. Now I'm getting my grandkids to memorise it. Do not use harmful words, but only helpful words. 
the kind that build up and provide what is needed so that what you say will do good to those who hear it. Isn't that good? Great scripture. One to memorize. So everything starts as a seed. Secondly, nothing happens until the seed is planted. If you can't do it, it just cannot do any good unless it is planted in the ground. Jesus used this about his, his future death, trying to explain the benefits that he, of his death, which his disciples found it difficult. He said this in, in, in John 12, 24, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, it cannot reproduce. But if it dies, it will produce much fruit. So my dad used to, to uh, with his tomato seeds, I mean, he used to get the, someone told me it's the right word. I don't know what, what these tomatoes were called, but he, he used to call them buxes. And I'm, I'm using the term buxom, but I think that's not a proper word, is it? Buxom. It's actually not, not the right word, isn't it? Because that has other connotations. But buxus, great big tomatoes. And dad would pick some of the biggest ones and say to the kids, don't you eat them? Because they look good. And he'd, he'd put them on a particular boat because he knew they had the most seeds in them. So he'd wait till they dried out. And then he'd get the seeds and he'd put them on a on a great big bench and, uh, and where they would dry out. And again, he'd warn us, don't touch them. And then he'd collect them all up and put them in jars and stick them really high in the shed so I couldn't climb up and get them and, uh, and cause mischief. And so those seeds he kept there for, for weeks, sometimes months, sometimes even longer. And, uh, but you know what? They were absolutely useless until my dad took the risk, did, did the risky business of actually planting them. And so what he used to do, he would plant them in these trays of special dirt that he had collected and and sow the seed and then up would come the little shoot after a period of time and then those those little tomato plants he would then grab and I still remember he had this this fork thing, he'd stick a hole in the ground and put them in and he taught me how to do that. And so, but nothing could be done with those seeds unless they died to themselves to be able to live again with resurrection life, new life that would come. And so, um, um, you know, they're useless unless you plant them. Um, Jesus said this in Mark 4, the kingdom of God is like someone who plants seed in the ground. Night and day, whether the person is asleep or awake, the seed still grows, but the person does not know how it grows. So I used to come out and try and say, you put the seed in there, and I'd be watch, waiting to see it come up. And, and uh, he said to me, don't you dare touch it. Because you know, the temptation is just to dig around and see if it's growing up. But uh, you, you've got to let it go. You've got to let it die. <laughs> you've got to be patient. You've got to be really patient. There's the element of faith. When you, when, when you sow godly seeds, they will germinate. But it requires faith. It requires patience. Some of you have put names up there. You may not see any change immediately or during this campaign, but don't give up. Don't give up praying. Don't give up being open to the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, help guide me to be a really good witness or to establish a witness with that person or to invite them to come, say, to Easter coming up, Good Friday services in the morning and evening, special services. They may not come to a normal Sunday, but they may come to a Good Friday service. Look at this verse here. Galatians 6, 9. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Hey, don't give up, be patient. So finally, the third thing I wanna say about, about, about uh, planting in, in, in faith is whatever I plant is what I'll reap. It's the law of reproduction. You will reap exactly what you plant. Galatians 6, 7 says that. You'll reap exactly what you plant. It's an invaluable rule of the universe. It'll either work for you or against you. A farmer doesn't wonder about what's going to grow. He he doesn't doubt what is going to grow. If my dad planted tomatoes, he wasn't expecting cucumbers or corn or cabbages. They'll be tomatoes. If he planted cabbages, he doesn't expect tomatoes. (laughs) If if I plant tomatoes, I'm going to get tomatoes. Because whatever I plant is what I'm going to reap. There's a phrase in Genesis, in the creation story, And over and over and over, it's used. Created things reproduced after their own kind. And this phrase is telling us that we always will reap the same thing that we actually sow. And it works both ways. It can work for you or it can work against you. Whatever I dish out, 
is what I'm gonna get back. And the Bible talks a lot about this. So let me read some, some scriptures in the negative. So I've put them up on, on the screen there. Here's some negative ones. Job says this, my experience shows that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. Proverbs 22 in the message says, whoever sows sin reaps weeds. In the New Living Translation, he says, those who plant seeds of injustice will, will harvest disaster. Hosea says this, but you have cultivated wickedness and harvested a thriving crop of sins. I don't want to harvest a thriving crop of sins. <laughs> Thank you. I don't want to cultivate wickedness. Matthew 7, Jesus says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Treat others as you want to be treated is the golden rule. No, no, just treat others as you want. How do you want to be treated? If you sinned and fell, how would you want to be treated? With judgment, harshness, vindictiveness, punishment, or mercy and understanding and forgiveness and, and restoration. So uh, it's very, very clear what the scriptures say. Now look at the positive ones. Positive examples, Proverbs 11. The one who sows righteousness will reap a sure reward. Hosea says, plant the good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a crop of love. Oh, who wants to harvest a crop, of, a crop of love or a crop of sin and wickedness? Love, thank you. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts for now is the time to seek the Lord. So sometimes we've got to just plow up the, our hearts, the soil of our heart and plant it within Love and joy and peace and justice and goodness because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So your seeds will come from deep within. You think of the opposite. If, if the opposite is, is there in your heart, it's going to come out. So men and women who, who, who think and, and plow their, their hearts and they sow lust and uncleanness and, and you know, things that are, that are not pretty and not good, it's gonna come out in abusive language and in, in sexual harassment and ugly things like that. How do the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak? That's why the scripture says, watch your heart. As you plow your heart, you make sure. If you have uncontrolled anger in your heart, if it's not dealt with, it's gonna come out with angry words and you're gonna end up cursing people and hurting them. Are you getting the idea that this is not some minor message of the Bible? <laughs> it's there all the way through. The laws of the harvest are true and they are powerful. You will reap what you sow with your children, with your wife, with your business, with your friends. It'll either work for you or it'll work against you. You sow anger and that's what you're gonna get. You get angry kids. You sow patience, that's when, you know, you're gonna get patient kids. You will reap what you sow, you get exactly what you plant. I cannot sow irresponsibility and reap success. I cannot sow laziness and reap reward. I cannot sow stinginess and reap a blessing. I remember when I was in, in uh, teaching at Mewden College and I'm pastoring the church, 1979 I think it was. So the church had put me on staff for I think half time and I was working half time uh, from nine to 12 at the, at the school teaching year 11, 12 kids, and then I would, I would actually go and do evangelism in high schools with about a dozen or so schools with young people that had set up groups. But I remember as the church was growing and as I'm busy doing other things, that I was doing less preparation for school. And I, I, whether it was a dream or a vision, or, or it was like a, a living nightmare, this thought came on me, in me, and it terrorized me, I think it was the Holy Spirit saying, and I had this, this, this vision that at the end of the year, Mr. Mewden's gonna say, Vasilakis, all your kids have failed. You lazy thing, you didn't put the work in. We paid you good money, so good riddance, go and do your church stuff. We don't want you back here. And I just like, oh, and I came to them. And he never said anything, I thought I was a pretty good teacher. None of my kids had failed the years before, but I was so convicted because I was doing far more for the church, but the school was paying me. So I, had, I repented. I said, God, help me to reorder my priorities. So I'd get up early in the morning and I wouldn't do my devotions then. 
I would actually do my preparation, say from 6.30 through to eight, to, to 8 or so, preparing the class, I'd do my, my class, I'd have lunch, I'd come back and I'd prepare the next lot of lessons till 3 o'clock. Then I start doing work for a couple of hours, go and pick up Kathy from work, come back, and then I still did my spiritual work and church work till about 10 o'clock at night. And, I came, and I, so I increased what I did. And at the end of the year, every one of my kids matriculated like the years before, and Mr. Mewton came up and said, could you give us another year, Bill? And I said, I'd love to, I love teaching. I said, but I can't, I said, I'm gonna die. I said, there's too many needs in the church. And he goes, you're our best teacher, please come. Uh, you know, if he said, I'm gonna triple your salary, I might have considered it. <laughs> But he never said that. And, uh, but you know, I, I realised then that when I left, I had a, a sense of healthy pride to say I've done the best I can, I wasn't lazy. I sowed my best into those kids. He was paying me good money, I sowed my best. And, and I think that, uh, you know, to imagine if, I, if the kids had failed, he says, we don't want you again. You fail as a teacher, now I'm gonna succeed as a pastor. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I cannot sow irresponsibility and reap success. I cannot sow laziness and reap a reward. I cannot sow stinginess and reap a blessing. The Bible is full of examples of this, both negative and positive. Remember Jacob in Genesis story. You know, his, his dad is Isaac and whose granddad is Abraham. And uh, Jacob, he was an awful man actually. He was not a nice man to hang around with. His name means supplanter, means cheat. He cheated everyone. He lied and schemed and cheated. So he cheats his, 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 his brother, and his brother goes nuts. His brother wants to kill him. He cheats him. He cheats his dad, lies to him. Then he takes off and goes to see Uncle Laban because he wants a woman, he wants a wife. He goes to Uncle Laban. Uncle Laban's even a bigger cheat. So Uncle Laban cheats him. So he, he's kind of like, what you've sown, you're now ripping, boy. So then he escapes <laughs> with one of the wives. <laughs> like he's working, for, he's working for the wrong wife. Like Uncle Laban tricks him, says seven years work and you can have her. And then the night of, of the wedding, he gives him the other daughter who wasn't the one he wanted. So he says, well, if you want the other one, you can have two, but you can work another seven years. I mean, Laban's a crook. So he escapes, Jacob escapes with his two wives there <laughs> and he's tearing back to daddy, Isaac. And then, he finds out that Esau's coming the other way. Laban's coming one way, Esau's coming the other way. He says, I'm dead meat, I'm gone. And that's when he finally gave his life to Christ. He yielded himself to God and he turns and repents and basically says, doesn't say, if, you know, God, if I do this, then you have to do that. He just said, God, you're God, take charge of my life. And the orientation of his life changed. He no longer sowed bad seed. God gave him a new name, Israel. He became the father of the, of the 12 tribes of Israel, became a magnificent human being. But I tell you what, the first part of his life, he was a scallywag and he repped what he sowed, but he learned the lesson and said, no more. I'm gonna sow the right stuff. This is the scripture I wanna finish with. Galatians 6, the person who plants selfishness Ignoring the needs of others, notice this, who plants selfishness, seeds that are self-centered, ignores the needs of other people and ignores God, harvests a crop of weeds. That's all they'd have to show for his life. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvests a crop of real life, eternal life. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't that wonderful? So for us as a church community, we're doing daring faith. You know, we, we produce this. Put it up on the, on the screen, guys. Now, I've given it to you, you've got, if you haven't received it. These are our faith goals. Faith stretching giving, active engagement, invest in generations, trips and, and training, Holy Spirit outreach. You can read the details on the, on the other side. But my challenge to you today is this. We, over the past two years, the church in Australia has really been hit, like the rest of society, by this COVID pandemic. We know that. I've done the stats. I know church numbers are down 30% in some quarters. Church finances are down 20, 20%. Ours was down to 20% the, first, the last four months. And I've addressed that to you, saying, hey, look, we really need to see our tithes go up to reach the budget level, otherwise we're gonna to have to cut back in areas that we don't wanna cut back in. And, I've encu and, and Milan is telling me that, that all of a sudden we are seeing some increase take place and I encourage you with that. 
and, and attendances have been down, finances have been down, that's right across the board. So we decided as a leadership team, we're not going backwards. We want to sow ourselves afresh to some faith goals and to encourage everyone who's part of the Christian Family Centre, all of us, you downstairs, upstairs, those of you who are watching on screen to say, you know what, it's time that we collectively sowed ourselves afresh to achieve our church-wide faith goals. We want to plant a new church by the end of next year. We want to see a missionary released to go overseas. We want to see some people go and live in Darwin and work for a few years and in Alice Springs to actually help our two churches because of their, their gear towards re- ministering to Aboriginal folks and their significant needs. And maybe some of you might, you know, there might be some of you that may go. And uh, we're believing for that. But that's, if you can sow yourself into the vision, that would be fantastic. Our, our finance goals, to see our tithes go up again. Commence tithing, or the $60,000 we need to finish off the, the, uh, the three-year stewardship campaign. We started in June 2019, interrupted a bit with COVID, but you've been so generous. 220 or so people have been giving towards it. We're just $60,000 short. So in two weeks' time, we're taking up a special offering. The kids are going to be in. We're going to put the big boxes out there and to say, let's celebrate and say, let's achieve this. We could achieve far more than 60 grand. And that can help us to do some other things, but a special support offering. These faith goals need us collectively to sow ourselves afresh and to, and to do some things that perhaps are uncomfortable for us or that we haven't done before to say, you know what, I'm part of the answer. I'm part of Jesus' army. I'm part of Jesus' body. I'm part of Jesus' bride. I'm, I'm a member of his, of his family. And we're going to provide answers to our lost and needy world. Can we stand together as I lead you in a prayer? Loving Father, thank you for the opportunity to minister your word as we're sharing on planting in faith. And I do ask, Lord, touch each heart here. Touch every person. Help us to see your laws of planting and harvesting. Help us to see that everything starts with a seed and nothing happens until a seed is planted. And that uh, whatever I plant is what I'm gonna reap and enable us, Lord, as your people, to rally around these faith goals that we've set for the next couple of years. Help us to sow our lives, our ministry, our time, our finance, our talents into the cause of Christ to see great things take place, for the church to be moving forward and not going backwards in any way or staying static. And so Lord, I pray, bless every person here. Help them to embrace this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you made a commitment of your life to Jesus and you personally received him, please make contact with us as we would love to help you understand more about who Jesus is and what he's done and the marvellous plans he has for your life. In fact, I would encourage you to read one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the beginning of the New Testament, and discover for yourself the wonder of, of his words and the incredible encouragement he was to so many people when he walked this earth and he can be and will be for you. If uh, you would like to make contact with any of our pastors or attend any of our services, you're you're most welcome uh, at uh, our Seaton campus. Until we meet again next week, every blessing on you.